Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. You guys can start making your way to your seats and getting settled in there. I want to welcome everyone here today that's here in person that I can see. And I also want to welcome our folks that may be joining us online. We're glad to have them uh, wherever they are in the world. I know that we've got some folks that tune in from uh, here in other parts of the county, but also the state and even out internationally. So we're overjoyed. And that's the beautiful thing about being a part of the church, the people of God, is the fact that no matter where we're from or where we're at, the same Spirit lives inside each of us. And we have the same Lord and Savior, and that's why we gather, to worship Him, to, to read from God's Word, and to see what He has to say to us, but also to be encouraged by one another. So just want to say welcome to each and every one of you. If you are a, a guest with us today, we want you to know that you're welcome, and that you're always welcome here with us at Anvil Baptist. I want to mention a few prayer requests before we move on. I, I know that... Uh, we've got a bit of a, an outbreak of the COVID in the middle school here in the county, and they've shut that down. And I know 11 cases last I heard, but also um, we, we know that some of our own, uh, Becky and Jason and Nikki and Roxanne, have the virus and all mild symptoms as of right now. But we want to just be remembering them in prayer and, and the school and, and just the, the, the situation with the pandemic. We want to keep praying in that regard. Also, just remember all of our schools, not just uh, the middle school, but the rest of the schools and even our folks that are in uh, college and university as well. A uh, bit of a praise. Marlene was, was, is, is home now, uh, as best I can tell. Praise the Lord for that. She's walking. And uh, this was... This is Marlene who wasn't able to move any, really have feeling or move anything in her body uh, last fall. And the Lord has just done a great work in her life. So uh, thank you all for your prayers and for her, but let's continue to lift her up uh, as we move forward. Also, I want to remember Brother Roger. Uh, she's still been struggling with his back. I know he'll probably be tuning in today. And, and also, he was one reason he's not here, he was around his grandson who, who had the virus. And so just for safety's sake, he's decided not to be here. He doesn't have it, uh, no symptoms of it that, that we know of, but we want to remember him. Also, I remember Linda Hacker. She went for a treatment this past week. We want to keep praying for her. And also, we want to remember this young Jonathan Roark, 10-year-old with a tumor on his, uh, in his, near his brain. And I think they didn't get a, a very good report last week. And so we just want to continue to pray for him and pray for that family. Uh, one final thing before I open up uh, the floor for requests. We want to remember uh, the lost. Those that don't know Jesus Christ as, as Lord and Savior. And pray that God would use us. and We'd be faithful in, in sharing the gospel and pointing people towards Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to stop right there. Any, any prayer requests that need to be mentioned that, that I've not uh, shared Remember uh, Casey's sister, Mary, we keep praying for her. Back here, Cindy. Okay. Okay. October. All right, that's uh, Cindy just mentioned it for those that might not have heard it and for folks that are online. Uh, Cindy's granddaughter, Addison, who we've been praying for, has been having migraines and different things, some issues with the heart, saying she's got to have a heart procedure, which will probably be scheduled in October, but it's not finalized. And when it is, we'll let you all know so that we can be praying for her. And why do we do this? Why do we spend this time? And why do we pray? Because we believe in the power of prayer. Not because of, of anything special with prayer itself, but it's because who we pray to. A God in whom nothing is impossible. A God who is all-powerful. He speaks and things are created. And so we lift all these requests up to Him. Is there any unspoken prayer requests by show of hand this morning? Maybe you don't want to mention that, but something's on your heart. We'll, uh, we'll be praying for those just in a few minutes. I want to share a couple of, of announcements. First off, right after today's service, we're going to be having a business meeting. And because of the pandemic, this is our... Our first one we've had in, in about a year. And so if you're able to stick around for that, I encourage you to do so. On September the 19th, that's a Saturday, about three weeks from now, we're going to be having a work day outside. 
So we're going to need you guys to, to loosen up those muscles, get them greased up, and uh, come and help us. We're going to be doing some mostly stuff outside, partly because we don't want to be cleaning out closets and things indoor with everybody all together, but be doing some work outside. So remember that, September the 19th. Any birthdays or anniversaries that we can mention, celebrate? Sitch? Okay, yeah. Uh, Tetch, you just remind me, the Irvin Baptist Association, of which we're a part, on September the 14th at 6.30 in, this, in the gymnasium here, we're going to be meeting. So if you would, we'd love for you to come and join us for that. Uh, I encourage you to speak to me after the service or after the meeting, and, and I can give you more details about that. Birthdays, anniversaries. All right, I know that Chris Hockham had one yesterday, so we want to wish him a happy birthday. As we move forward, uh, as always, our offering plates are over here on the table. Uh, for those that are online, you can send your, your gifts and tithes to P.O. Box 64 in Anvil or at anvilbaptist.com. There's a way to do it there. Now I'm going to ask Brother Ben Gilbert if he would open us in prayer, and then we'll have a time of singing and worship together.
Miss David this morning, he's, he works at the middle school, and so he thought best to not, to not be here today, so we certainly miss him. He always helps us with sound, and as I look around, it's good to see Brother Wade over here as well. I know he's had uh, surgery on his foot, but it's so great to see you, Wade, and have you back. We've been praying for you, and it's a reminder we'll, we'll keep praying for you uh, as well. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to God's Word, and, and today is actually the, the fourth part 
in a four-part series on the book of Ruth. And if you've not been here uh, over the past several weeks, or maybe you've missed a couple, it's okay. I'm going to do a bit of a review of this story to try to catch us all up uh, to, to where we all are and, and focusing primarily on chapter 4 today. And it's a series that's entitled From Tragedy to Triumph. And you'll see as I wrap up today, that's not just the story of this particular book, but this is the story of God from tragedy to triumph, our story. And we'll get to that to the end. And as I said, today we're going to be focusing primarily on chapter 4. And today's message is titled, A Redeemer Makes Way for The Redeemer. A Redeemer Makes Way for The Redeemer. Now let me just give you a bit of review and, and where we are in this particular story. We saw in chapter 1 in the first week that a Jewish man by the name of Elimelech, he took his wife named Naomi, and they left Bethlehem, they left the, the land of God, God's land there in Israel, and they went to a neighboring place called Moab. And they took their two sons as well. And while they were there in Moab, the unthinkable happened. Elimelech passed away and died. And Naomi is left with her two sons. Her two sons married two Moabite women, a lady named Orpah and another lady by the name of Ruth. They're married for ten years, both of them. And after ten years, Naomi's two sons pass away. So Naomi is left in a foreign land with two daughter-in-laws. She hears that the famine in Bethlehem had ceased. That's the reason they left originally. So she, she decides to go back to God's land, to, to Bethlehem. And the daughter-in-laws wanted to go with her. But she encouraged them. She said, no, you, you go back. You go back to your family. You get married. You have a life. And one of them, Orpah, that she left and went back. But one of them, Ruth, in which the, this, book is, this particular book is named after, she said, no, I'm going with you. And she had this beautiful statement, this beautiful phrase. She said, wherever you go, I'll go. And that should sound familiar because that's why we sang this song. She said, wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you go, your people will be my people. Wherever you die, I will die. And she goes with her, and they return to Bethlehem, and when they get there, they're the talk of the town. Because not only has, has Naomi, the years, taken a lot of toll on her, she was named Pleasant. You know, her name actually meant Pleasant. But now she said, don't call me Pleasant. She said, call me Mara, because Mara meant bitterness. She said, I'm bitter, bitter at God, but just bitter in life. And so they come back with nothing, and they're helpless and hopeless, and the people are talking about her because her son had married a Moabite, and this was kind of the, one of the sworn enemies of the people of God. And so at that point, we didn't know what was going to happen. But we trusted, as just as the title of this message series says, that we trusted that God was going to turn tragedy into triumph. And just so happens, as the story goes on, Ruth goes out into a barley field to glean just to pick up scraps out of the field and she meets the owner of that field, a man by the name of Boaz. And Boaz is this virtuous character, not only wealthy, but, but just in good standing with the community. And we find out in the story that actually Boaz is, is a close relative to Ruth. So Naomi gets this scheme we talked about last week. Naomi has this scheme to have Ruth go into the threshing floor, and she goes in there, and Ruth does the unthinkable. She actually proposes to Boaz on this threshing floor, which is strange because she was a woman proposing to a man. She's a poor woman proposing to, to a, a more wealthy type man. And in that culture, women didn't propose to men either. But she did this. She stepped out in faith. She was obedient to Naomi. And Boaz says, you know what? I'll marry you. And they were like, whoo, this kind of this romance is kind of budding, this love story, we're thinking there's going to be some resolution to it. But Boaz says, but wait a minute. I can't marry you yet because actually there's a kinsman that has basically the first priority to marry you. So I've got to check with him. And so last week when we left off the story, Boaz sent, Na or sent Ruth with a bunch of barley home to Naomi and they were just going to sit and wait and see what was going to happen. And we're left off in that story wondering, what's this other guy, this closer kinsman who has priority to marry Ruth, what's he going to say? Because, you know, when you watch a movie, you know, you see the, the two main characters, the love interest, and you just, deep, you know, kind of silently, we kind of root for them, right? And we want to see them get married. But we're left off last week again wondering what's going to happen. So that's where our story picks up this week. Boaz is going to try to find this kinsman. And so what does he do? I'll just, 
I'm not going to read 1 through 12. I'm just going to tell you the story. Boaz walks down to the gate of Bethlehem. It's a place where people go in and out of the city. And he sat down there and he waited for this kinsman. He knew, he knew he, they were family. He knew who he was. He probably even knew when he would be coming through about what time. And so he sees the kinsman. He's like, hey, 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 friend, cousin. Maybe you call him cuz, you know, cuz, come here, sit down and talk with me. And then he's like, okay, uh, you over here, you. He gets ten elders and has them all come over and sit down. And they sit down and he starts to talk. And, and why was the elders there? Because he's about, they're about to have a transaction of business here. And the elders needed to be there to, to provide witnesses for this. It was kind of like their courtroom. Now for us, we'd take something like this to the courts. But for them, they just do it in a public place. So they're at this gate. The kinsman is there. And Boaz says this. He says, hey, that, you might have heard. I mean, it's hard not to have missed this. But Naomi returned with her daughter-in-law, this Moabite woman, Ruth. And so now Naomi is going to have to be, she's going to be forced to sell her land because she didn't have any money. She's going to have to sell this land. And, and you have first priority to buy this land. And I'm going to get into kind of the technicalities and specifics of it as we move through the message today. But he says, you have first priority to buy this land. What do you think about it? And, and deep down, we're listening. We're like, I hope he doesn't buy it, you know, because Ruth is kind of a package deal with it. And he says, okay, no problem, I'll buy it. And we're like, whew, does this mean he's going to marry Ruth, but we want Ruth to marry Boaz? He says, I'll, I'll do it. I'll redeem the land. I'll buy it. And then Boaz says, but, but there's a catch. Here's the catch. If you buy this land belonging to Limelech and Naomi, you also acquire this Moabite woman, Ruth, and you'll have to marry her. And when he heard this, he's like, whoa, <laughs> I, I can't do that. He says, I, I would then mess up my, my family's inheritance. And I think what he's saying there is that he had kids. He had family already, had kids. And so if Ruth came into the family and he gave kids to her in the, and to create and to continue on Naomi's family line, then they would have to split the inheritance. His kids would have to split the inheritance with Ruth's kids. And he said, no, I, I can't do this. So he said, you know what? You, you're next in line. You buy the land, and you take Ruth. And at that point, this near kinsman, he takes off his shoe. It's his sandal. And we're thinking, what on earth is he going to do with this shoe or this sandal? And he gives it to Boaz. And in those days, this meant that the transaction was final. And again, you've got ten elders there. They're watching their witnesses to this transaction. Now, we go to the courts, and we sign papers. And I like that much better than receiving somebody's dirty, stinky shoe. Amen? But they, it was proof that this transaction was finalized. And the elders there and the people that are listening... And, and the thing about being in the doorway or the gate to the city is you've got people traveling on. You know how small towns, people like to hear all the business and everything that's going on. I'm sure they're all just kind of circling around, just kind of listening to this conversation. But after this transaction happens, the sandal is passed... They all then give their blessing to Boaz and a blessing of prosperity to Boaz and to Ruth and to their family. And, and then the moment we've been waiting for, we've been in this book about a month now, the moment we've been waiting for comes and it happens and it takes place because we're wanting to see Ruth and Boaz be married. And here we have it in verse 13. We're going to pick up and start reading there. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And that's the wedding scene right there. And I know ladies, ladies, you all love the wedding. And many of you dream about it your whole life. And you think about how you want this and this. But this is all we get right here, the details. Just half of a little verse right here. They, they get married. But again, that's what we're wanting. That's what we're hoping for. So they get married. This is the wedding scene. And when, he went into, when Boaz went into her euphemism... The Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Now, let's just stop right here. And I, I didn't talk about this earlier. But when, when they were back in Moab, and Ruth was married to her, uh, to Naomi's son, Malon, or Machlon, depending on how you want to say it, if you do the Hebrew name, he, she'd been married to him for ten years before he passes away. 
And you may say, Dave, well, what's the big deal? What, what, what's the point there? In those days, you didn't wait to have kids. You got married and you had kids if you could. Right? You're following, you're tracking, because kids, you, you know, not, you wanted the, the family name to carry on, but also you wanted kids to take care of you in your older age and also to help uh, make ends meet there in the family. For ten years, she was married to him, and you know how many kids she had? Zero. She was barren for ten years. And, in, and we can make that assumption. I don't want to read too much into that, but think about this. Here's a woman... Married for 10 years without children. And, and even today, I know that can, can bring up some frustration and heartache in families. But in those days, imagine that being intensified even more. And for 10 years, she could not bear a child. And you may say, well, why? And maybe in that moment, maybe she even asked God, why? Why? Why me? Why, why, does it, why is this not happening and I'm sure she prayed many times to God. Or maybe her husband is praying as well. But then, notice that. And sometimes in the moment we don't see what God's plan is on in the future as well. In those moments. Those moments of tragedy, we don't know. And in those ten years of barrenness, we didn't know. She didn't know what God had planned for her. But, her, but God's plan was far better than her own plan for her own life. And then look at what this verse says right here. It says, The Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. The Lord was gracious to her. God's plan wasn't for her to have a kid with, with Milan. God's plan was for her to have a kid with Boaz. And we're going to see at the very end, this is very significant. Not only for the story of, of Naomi and Ruth, but in the story, the biblical story, and, and they're reaching out even to our own story, because we're going to see that we're, we're going to be joining this family through faith in Christ. But verse 14, let's look at this. Let's keep moving here. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. She's basically, the people are exalting her, but also her daughter is better than seven sons. Seven sons is a number of perfection. This is the greatest. You could have seven wonderful sons, but this, this daughter-in-law is even better to you. And she's giving you this, this child. And so the women of Bethlehem, they're praising Naomi and her situation here. But think about this. Go back to the very beginning. This is a reversal of the introduction because remember, what, was, what did she want to be called when she returned to Bethlehem? She said, call me Mara. Call me bitterness. But here, because of the way the God's sovereign work and God's sovereign plan, here we see rejoicing and people even praising her because of the work that God had done in and through this particular situation. And so she's no longer Mara or bitterness. She's once again Naomi. She's pleasant. Verse 16, And Naomi took the child... And laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. She was like a nanny to it. And, and if, if any of you know, if you, even if you have grandchildren, you know the great joy. I mean, I've heard that kids are wonderful, but grandkids, whew, how amazing are they, right? Because you can spoil them, spend time, and send them home to mommy and daddy. Amen? <laughs> but the joy of grandkids, and Naomi gets to experience this. And when the women, her neighbors, gave it to a name, saying, so they gave this child a name, there's a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is interesting here in this story because it seems as if the townspeople actually named him, which is pretty unique, but they called him Obed, which means servant. And when you read through the Bible, you know how many stories you're going to find about Obed? Zero. He's listed in genealogies, but we have zero stories about Obed. But what's important about Obed, we see at the end of the book of Ruth. And th therefore, we're going to see the significance of the story of Ruth. The significance is whose son belongs to Obed and also his grandson. You, we've already read it, but I want, to, I want to read this. Verses 18 through 22 give us a family line, like a, a family tree. 
a lineage. It says, now these are the generations of Perez. Perez beget Hezron. And again, if you don't know how to pronounce these words, don't worry. Just read them quickly and confidently because nobody else knows how to pronounce them as well. So just keep moving through. And Hezron beget Ram, and Ram beget Amminadab, and Amminadab beget Nashon, and Nashon beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz. Here we go. We know Boaz. That's familiar. And Boaz begat Obed. And Obed begat Jesse. Again, another familiar name. And Jesse begat David. One of my favorite characters in the Bible for obvious reasons. But David, what, what do we know about David? This is the same King David that we read about in the Old Testament. And so, don't, don't miss this in the, in the beauty of the story here. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. This makes Boaz and Ruth the great-grandparents of King David. And, and you may say, well, why, why is that significant? Well, here, here's the thing. Naomi and Ruth, at the very beginning, they practically had nothing. No future, no hope, and no name. No, no uh, heir to carry on their family name. And yet, here we see that after they are redeemed by Boaz, they now not only have a family in the future, but what do they have? They are now ancestors of King David. And if they are ancestors of King David, that means they are ancestors of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in Boaz and Ruth's family line. And when you get to the Gospel of Matthew... The writer there, Matthew, he starts his gospel basically going through the royal lineage of Jesus Christ. The family of Jesus. And he traces it. And there are, there's actually listed there four women. And that's kind of strange because most genealogies, they just trace it through the man. But there's four women. You know what? One of, uh, who one of those four women are? Ruth. And she not only is Ruth, but she wasn't even a Jew. She was a Gentile. She was a non-Jew. And here she is in Jesus' royal family line. And, and how is that possible? It's possible because of Boaz's work as a kinsman redeemer. And I told you that we would spend a little time talking about this. But Boaz was what's called a kinsman redeemer to Ruth and Boaz. And kinsman is a word that shows up often throughout the book of Ruth. Sometimes it's translated kinsman. Sometimes it's translated as redeemer. And so oftentimes they put it together and they call it, they call the role a kinsman redeemer. And the Old Testament gives us instructions about what a kinsman redeemer is. And so basically you see it up here. A kinsman redeemer was a close male relative who had the responsibility to act on behalf of another relative who was in trouble, who was in danger, or who is in some great need, or maybe even experienced some form of hostility. So what would this kinsman redeemer do? Is what would they would do? They would deliver this kinsman out of trouble, or the property that belonged to that particular kinsman. That's why Boaz was going to buy the land as well. So it's not just redeeming a person out of slavery, but also to redeem a person, this person's property that might have gotten sold because of a, a, a dire need of, of financial need. So what, what's that saying here? So if a kinsman redeemer, how would they redeem? They would redeem a person or they redeem a property by buying it back. Or buying it from someone who had bought it from them. Maybe it was oppression. Maybe it was enslavement. Or whatever. Maybe some sort of binding obligation. But they had the responsibility to help that kin, kinsman or that relative help get them out of trouble if they were in it. Now, now stay with me on that. that. That's what Boaz does here. Because not only does it pertain to property and to enslavement, but also for family name. Because if a person didn't have kids, and they couldn't carry on their family name, it was up to the kinsman redeemer to then provide an heir and someone to keep their name going on to, for the next generation. You see an example of this in, in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 22, Jesus is approached by the Sadducees who didn't believe the resurrection. And of course, that's why they were sad, you see, because they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And, he, and they, they give him this hypothetical story. They say, Jesus, say a man is married to his wife 
and they don't have kids, and the man dies. And then the brother comes and marries this, this the wife, and they don't have kids, and he dies, and then they go on to the next brother, next brother. And of course, the Sadducees, they ask this question, well, who's... Husband will be, which husband or brother will be married to the woman in the time of resurrection? And Jesus says, you know, you don't, you don't understand the resurrection. You don't understand heaven because in heaven we're not going to be married and given in marriage. Tetch and I will not be married in heaven. We will be brothers and sisters. Part of marriage in this life is to point us forward to the great eternal marriage, which is the, bride, the marriage between the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and his beautiful bride, the church. But I bring this up right now because you see the example. The brother died. He didn't have any kids. So it was the responsibility of the next of kin, which is the brother, to then marry and try to, to, to have kids that carried on the family name. I hope you see this. So it was, it was just a part of the culture there. And so Boaz, in this story, faithfully acts as the kinsman redeemer for Ruth and Naomi. He purchases the land of Elimelech. We've talked about this already. And he freed Ruth and Naomi from poverty and even Ruth from widowhood. But also, he redeems Elimelech. How does he redeem Elimelech? Because he makes it to where his name and his family continues on, even after Elimelech was dead. Think about that. God was still working to give favor to Elimelech even after he had passed away and to his family and to Naomi. So he does this. So here we go. Boaz is a redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. But amazingly, what's what's amazing about this story and how it ends with this genealogy, not only is he a redeemer, but he makes way for the redeemer, for Jesus Christ. Because again, Jesus comes from his family line. And we know from reading the Gospels and from reading the Bible that Jesus is a far greater redeemer than Boaz. And why is that? Because think about Boaz. Think about what Boaz did. Boaz spread his garment of protection over Ruth. You know, that's what she says in the threshing floor. She says, hey, spread your garment over me, which is very much a proposal marriage language. But Boaz spreads his garment of protection over Ruth when she was needy, when she was helpless, she was hopeless, and she was unable to rescue herself. Boaz does this for her. She re- he redeemed her and made her his wife, his bride. Now, when we look at our own lives, and I want to take this forward and always take it to the cross, take it to the gospel. And some of you may say, David, we know when you preach towards the end, you're always going to take us to Jesus Christ. And you're right. I hope you see that pattern because I always want to take us always to the foot of the cross to let us realize our great need in this life which is Jesus Christ because of our sinfulness and our great need for the gospel. And you may say, well, how how does this relate to this? Because think about this. We too are like Ruth. Helpless. Hopeless. Unable to save ourselves. Unworthy to help ourselves. But yet what does Jesus do? Jesus came while we were enemies, while we were yet sinners. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us when we were hopeless and helpless, when we were in bondage to sin. And what did He do on the cross? He shed His blood and He paid the full price for our redemption. See, Boaz paid paid physical money to buy the land. What does Jesus do? Jesus pays for us our redemption with His shed blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And we're all sinners, separated from God. And so what did God do on the cross? What did Jesus do? He redeemed us. He rescued us. He saved us. He saved us from the bondage of sin and death. And He saved us from an eternity in hell, separated from God. Oh yes, hell is a real place. And who goes there? Those that are condemned. Those that have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so He rescued us. Those of us who put our faith and trust in Him. And what did He do? He bought us for Himself. And we become His people. And He bought us and and saved us out of the curse, out of destitution. And what does He do? And this is the connection. This is beautiful here. He has made us His own beloved bride. The church. Jesus Christ has redeemed us, made us His bride, and blessed us for all generations. 
Romans 3, 23 and 24. We know 23, we quote that often. But look at what 24 says after that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So he starts out, we're all sinners. I've, I've made this point already. But he says, being justified freely by His grace, we are made righteous. We are righteous in God's sight. Because of His grace. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. And how is that made possible? Through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Through the Redeemer. Capital R, Redeemer. See, we don't deserve that. And we can't earn it, but yet Jesus the Redeemer does it for us. Because, and then we see that Jesus is the Redeemer. He's the true kinsman redeemer, all of us, for all of us who call on him in faith. Jesus is the true kinsman redeemer for all who call on him in faith. Let me just stop here and ask you this more, maybe online or even here today. Have you called on the name of Jesus Christ to save you? Are you trusting him alone for salvation, to save you from hell, to, to be able to lead you and to take you to heaven someday? Is your faith fully in Christ? Have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? If you've not done that, I beg you to do that today. Stop what you're doing. Do it now if you can. Stop and do that. Call out to Jesus Christ and He will save you because He's already paid the price to redeem you. He's already done what's needed to purchase you for Himself and to be His people, to be His bride for all eternity. Do that today. As we wrap this story up, we see that this story ends on a happy note. And they, we could even say, you know, they don't say it, but if in today's, if this was a book written today, you know what it would say? And they lived happily ever after, right? And we love stories that have happy endings, right? I mean, that's one reason I think we watch. I mean, when you get to the end of, of a movie or a, a good book, and it has this happy ending, and there's just this joy, and there's this sense of closure, Right? But you've watched those movies and those books that don't end well, right? And you're just left like, some of you are like, man, I hate, I don't, I don't like that movie at all because of the way it ends, right? Because we, we want happy ending. There's something about that. We, we want to see the, the, the two main characters. We want to see them end up together. We want a happily ever after. But it's not always that way in this life. We don't always see a happy ending. But however, here's what we do know. That for those of us in whom Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, for those of us who are in Christ, who are part of the people of God, there will be a happy ending. And I don't care how rough, how difficult, how terrible maybe circumstances are in your life right now, how dark, what kind of valley you're walking through, I don't know. I know we're all in different places experiencing different things, but we need to believe and we need to know that there is a happy ending for those who are in Christ. And you say, Dave, well, how do you know that? Because I've read the end of the Bible. I know the ending. And you know what the ending says? Although it doesn't say these words exactly, but you know what the ending is? Jesus Christ wins. And therefore, because Jesus Christ wins, Jesus Christ is triumphant, we too are triumphant because we are in Christ. And we are part of God's people. We are part of the bride of Jesus Christ. And there is great hope in that. No matter how difficult your situation is here, we have hope in the fact that there is a happy ending. And why is that? Because we serve and worship a God who turns tragedy into triumph. He turns tragedy into triumph. And ultimately, we will be triumphant because Christ is triumphant. And that is, there is great hope in that. Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for this this book that was written so many years ago. It's not just a story, God. We know that, that there were real people that lived this story out and it was recorded, historically recorded for us, God. But ultimately, this, this story always points us forward to You, God, a God in, who, in whom brings great triumph out of tragedy and gives us great hope and redeems us, Father, when we don't deserve it. We can never deserve it, God. We don't earn it, 
But yet you did it for us, God. That's the beautiful part of the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Is your grace that you pour out. You give it to us freely. We can't thank you enough for that. And God, I pray for those that might be here today or listening that haven't put their faith and trust in your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that they would sense and feel the spirit of God convicting them of their their sin. Knowing that they've not experienced the redemption, the free redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And they would surrender their life to you completely. And so God, we, we just pray that you work and move in the next few moments as we worship you, as we exalt you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back here and get a song going. It speaks about our Redeemer. And again, if you're here today and you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can do that today. But then the rest of you, if you say, I've already done that, reflect on what Jesus Christ has done for you. Meditate on that in the next few moments. Worship Him. Exalt Him. If there's areas in your life you say, I know I'm not living faithfully to Christ, repent of that right now and turn Seek God's forgiveness and worship Him in the next few moments as this song plays.
You know, Boaz was a redeemer, but you know, his bones are somewhere in the Middle East. But our redeemer lives. He's as alive today as he was back when he walked this earth. So praise be to God for that. I'll be around afterwards just for a few moments if anybody wants to talk, have prayer, and then we'll transition into a time of a business meeting. Folks need to use the bathroom, do whatever after that. And, and I'm going to ask Brother Doug York if he'll close us in a word of prayer. Amen. You're dismissed. Go and be the church. Members, please stick around.